Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Matthews from Princeton University uh, to post him and uh, Professor Fish did a lot of in basic plasma physics. He was the first who introduced driving currents for heating tokamak plasma, many works in plasma instabilities, also in space jet law, diets, and many other things uh, cannot be they give everything, including compression of uh, electromagnetic waves in plasma. And I think today will be a very interesting talk. So please. Oh, thank you very much yeah, for the introduction. Um, and you know, I, think, I think I have this. Can everybody hear me? What? Lemala, Yoter Karov. Is that closer to your mouth? <laughs> okay, are people better? That's okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about compressing waves in plasma. And there's, there's, um, there's two kinds of, of themes, there are two themes to my talk today. So, because I'm interested in waves in general, and, and somehow I don't really feel like I understand the wave until I start compressing it and, and turning it and things like that. So, uh, the two ways of compressing waves is one, to make it more intense in time, and, um, and that's through a nonlinear interaction with other waves. And the other, the other method is um, to, uh, to just compress the medium, and then anything that's in it can also get compressed. So, um, so the first thing, I have to mention um, the, the Nobel Prize in Physics this year was given for Turpol's amplification, in part, um, to uh, Gerard Rowe and Donna Strickland. Um, and uh, and the, um, the, the particular thing that they did, what did they do? They say if a pulse is compressed in time and becomes shorter, then more light is packed together in the same tiny space, and the pulse increases dramatically. Now, why was this so important? Well, it was important for many reasons that you can imagine would come out of it because you could have pulses that were down and run more intense for this triple amplification technique. But also, um, they, um, it, the, the reason why it was, it was a hard thing to do is because you couldn't amplify pulses when they were very intense, because there's just limitations to material media. So what, what, what Maru and Strickland did was to take a, a short pulse, and then they would stretch it. And and when it was stretched, there was much less power. And then they would amplify, amplify the stretched out pulse, and then they would recombine it. So they would, they would, they would have a, a, a rating that was matched with the initial rating that would then recombine it after it was amplified. And then like this, you could get to dramatically higher power. It's basically a factor of a thousand, or so more than was previously possible. And uh, what this opened up, it opened up um, uh, just a, a whole number, oops, it just opened up a whole number of um, applications. Uh, just, just there's, there's, I'm just taking slides from the Nobel Committee. Um, when you have uh, short pulses, instead of having the end second, you have an femtosecond, and you can do uh, uh, much less damage when you're trying to drill holes. Um, just the whole idea of going to higher intensities also means going to shorter durations in time, and that allows one to probe shorter and shorter phenomena. Um, it, finally, people want to probe out of seconds, that's a billionth of a billionth of a second, 10 to the minus 18 seconds. That's uh, that's about the time it takes an electron to go around an atom. And then, and then there is hope to get to even higher intensities. Okay, this is also from the Nobel Committee. 
um, uh, talking about about some ways of uh, this is through this this European uh, laser uh, a series of lasers in uh, in Europe where they hope to get to even higher intensities. Yeah. So my my first theme of this talk is to look at um, compressing waves in plasma and to ask the question whether light can be compressed in time in plasma with the goal of reaching laser intensities then would be higher than using material elements. So we could even take the output of the chirp pulsed amplifier. I mean there's a limit. There's a limit to to how well you can do with these chirp pulse amplifiers. We start with a short pulse, we, we stretch it, we bring it back together, but then, but then before, when you bring things back together, you have to bring it back together in a material element, some sort of gradient. Something that will bring all these different frequencies, these different colors, bring it back together in the original pulse. You're going to be limited in intensity and also in flows, how much, how much uh, total amount of, of energy Goes, goes through per, per area. And the actual uh, elements that, that you're actually missing are huge. Um, they're huge and they're very expensive and they're fragile. So now, if you want to see what it takes, did people see, see the colors here? Not so well. Okay, should we, should we dim the lights? Okay, anyway, well, I could just explain this figure over here, but if somebody thinks that they would be better with the first light, they can do it anyway. Um, so, so um, if you actually look to see at that final gradient, uh, what is the intensity of the light? It's uh, terawatts per centimeter squared. Uh, terawatts, 10 to 12 watts per centimeter squared. Now, now, 10 to 12 watts per centimeter squared is basically enough, almost enough, to bring electrons out of metal. It, 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 it gets to be serious. But, um, oh, is, is that too dark now? <laughs> uh, so, we should do it democratically. How many people want it dark? There is a middle. You want to sleep? Okay, all right. Um, Okay, this is good? Okay. All right, okay, so you have a gigawatt per centimeter squared in an amplifier. You then compress it to terawatts per centimeter squared. So terawatts per centimeter squared, that's, that's about as much as you can stand in, uh, in material. But in a plasma, that's nothing. And what I, what I mean by nothing is that at a terawatt centimeter squared and one micron light, the electrons are not, are not moving around relativistically. They're just moving around basically linearly in the light. So you have, you have to go another five orders of magnitude uh, before you really run into relativistic effects for electrons. So that means that, that the lowest order parametric interactions in plasma will behave nicely. And that's that's exactly what we're going to we're going to uh, talk about. Well, this is just uh, some of the damage thresholds that that people have have found for these kinds of ratings. Um, let me tell you what, what what how we would do things in a plasma. So so um, to get to the highest intensities in plasma, uh, making use of a nonlinear interaction. What we would do is we would have a pump beam. What do I mean by a pump beam? I mean a beam of light that has a lot of energy, but the energy is over a long amount of time. So its intensity is not so large. Okay, that's the state of the art perhaps of what we can do with, with a beam of energy. And then counter propagating to that is a seed pulse. And the seed pulse is of short duration. And I'm looking for an interaction in which the seed pulse can propagate through the pump beam in the plasma and take all the energy out of the pump beam and still remain short. So that's the idea. So there's a, um, the, the, the lowest order, say lowest order, lowest order in the intensities uh, of in, in, um, 
in uh, plasma, you can have a Raman decay interaction. I'm drawing the dispersion relation frequency versus K. Uh, so I, I have a pump and I have a counter propagating seed. And uh, to satisfy a resonance condition with the plasma frequency, that I can have a decay of the pump into the counter propagating wave and the plasma wave. So that's the interaction. And um, the interesting thing about this interaction is not that I take all the photons from the pump and put it into the counter propagating wave, <clears throat> but that I do so um, in a, in a nonlinear fashion. Um, basically a super radiant fashion. Basically there, there is a regime in which, in which as the, the seed pulse goes through the pump, the front of it gets amplified and it shadows the back of it so the seed gets even shorter as it goes through the pump beam. And it takes all the energy out of the pump, or at least 90% uh, uh, of the energy or so uh, proportional to the, to the frequencies. And how do we imagine this amplifier to work? Well, we imagine the seat pulse focusing on a target, and the pump beam is um, counter propagating, and it's going through a slam of plasma. We might imagine for micron radiation, uh, the uh, plasma slab might be a centimeter, um, just to give you a feel for, for, for this. So, um, so okay, so, so I'm still not going to prove to make a talk with too many equations, but you should just know that, that this is um, this is this interaction is mediated by three wave equations, uh, the three oscillator equations, the the, the the two lasers that are counter propagating, and then also the plasma wave, um, and and in this regime in which you have this. Uh, the front of the pulse being amplified and shadowing the back of it, you have a special self-similar solution. In other words, as you propagate further and further, you um, you get shorter and shorter. And uh, you, get, you can uh, write the, um, the the amplitude since the amplitude shadows, the amplitude grows according to time, and the duration goes as one over time. And the energy basically goes with time or with distance that you travel. So basically, you eat up all the pump energy, and as you do so, you get shorter and shorter. It gets shorter because you're, as as the pump gets to, as the seed gets to be more and more intense, it gets more, it gets better at depleting the pump energy. So when you deplete, deplete the pump energy, you shadow the backward side of the pulse, so it gets shorter in time. So this is exactly what we were looking for. We wanted to find a way of taking a lot of energy over a long period of time and putting it into light that would be over a very short period of time. Now, these, these, these equations over here, they're just the light equations, light going through a plasma and the plasma wave. Um, it, it really operates at, at every wavelength. I mean, if I just wanted to go to, this would just scale easily, if I wanted to go to higher uh, frequency lasers and higher frequency plasmas, namely more dense plasmas, I could do that too. Um, the, um, the numbers that one gets out of here in terms of what are the, what can you possibly get are rather large. So uh, for one micron radiation, um, the alpha pulse intensities can reach uh, maybe 10 to the 17th watts per centimeter squared. So that would be about four or five orders of magnitude larger than you could get from chair pulse amplification. Now this is comparing it to chair pulse amplification at the final grading. So just as at the final grading you would then have to have a further focusing to get maybe another factor of 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th, 10th, um, the same in a plasma. You would have some focus happen after the plasma, and just the amplification in the plasma would be would, would be just four or five orders of magnitude. But presumably, you could then also have the vacuum focus that gets you with the uh, final uh, the eight orders of magnitude. So in principle, at one micron you can do uh, quite well. Um, 
So, so uh, what's the thing that limits you? I mean, why can't you even go to higher than 10 to the 17th? Well, there are certain, at some point, the pulse gets so intense that, it's, that, that the electrons are relativistic. The, the pump doesn't make the electrons relativistic, but the pulse becomes so intense to make the electrons relativistic. And then the equations I wrote start not to be valid anymore. Someone has a question? Is there something there? There is self-focusing effect in the plasma or no? Um, there, there is a self-focusing effect, and the self-focusing is a relativistic effect. So that's exactly the effect that I'm talking about. So, um, so when people talk about self-focusing in plasma, usually they're talking about, about pulses that are after triple amplification, after focusing, and once they already have relativistic intensities. And then there is an issue with propagating such pulses through plasma. Remember that in this case over here, at 10 to the 17th uh, watts per centimeter squared, I'm not very relativistic. I'm just beginning to be relativistic. So self-focusing is, is beginning to onset. It's beginning to happen, but it's not developed. So as soon as I get to that intensity, I cut the plasma off, and I exit the pulse. And, and then I'm classical self-focusing? And classical self-focusing? Excuse me? Classical self-focusing due to refractive index changes. Okay, so there's several kinds of self-focusing. One is the relativistic self-focusing, which is unavoidable in plasma. Uh, the other thing, other kinds of self-focusing would be for ionized in plasma. Everything here is fully ionized, so we're not going to do that. Another kind of self-focusing would be blowing plasma out of the way. But that's for long pulses, not short pulses. So for short pulses, as the type that we have here, we worry about the, uh, the fact that electrons, when they move in the pulse, they're relativistic, so their mass is changed relative to the periphery. So that's, that's the kind of self-focusing that's most worrisome for these kinds of pulses. And as soon as that happens, we cut them. Okay, that's, that's why we don't go to 10 to the 18th. That's why we go to 10 to the 17th. However, if we go and look at a quarter micron radiation, for example, um, or even, even shorter wavelengths than that, then so the, way, the way, at the same intensity, the way electrons oscillate in a light wave goes as, well, it's one over the, the, the velocities go as one over the frequency, because if the frequency is very large, the light wave uh, changes electric field very rapidly so that the electrons never have a chance to really get that much speed. Well, that means that as I go to hot to shorter wavelength, I can, um, I can end up with larger output powers because I don't have this limitation as severely. At the same time, at the same time, as I go to shorter wavelength and the theoretical output intensities are larger, uh, the triple amplification becomes more difficult. And the triple amplification works for one micron light. But if I look, I'm trying to amplify uh, proton fluoride lasers at a quarter micron, or um, if I try to amplify basically shorter wavelengths than that, these gratings are impossible to build. They become more fragile. Uh, they won't withstand even the large powers we have before. So, so triple amplification works at one micron, but then at shorter wavelengths, it begins not to work at all. And then you must go to plasma. But in principle, going to plasma, it's even easier at least in terms of the output radiation, um, the output intensities. However, um, there are a number of technological issues because as I go to shorter wavelengths, I have to go to larger densities in plasma, and then I have to create such plasmas, and I have to work with them. Um, so, so we have technological problems in that, which I'll begin to go into just a little bit over here. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just show what it is, this, 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 this nonlinear solution, how that develops. Um, so I'm just looking at, let's go, I'll stop that. So, so I have, in red, I just have, this is an old, uh, very, very one-dimensional plot. Um, they, I have a pump going, it's probably those simple three-way equations. I have a pump going to the right, and my plasma wave in green is going to the left. And left behind, which is because it has zero group velocity, is the plasma wave. So
So you can see that the, that the seed wave is eating up the intensity of the, of the pump wave. Uh, some of it is going back to the pump wave. And, um, and you get this uh, so-called tight pulse formation that has this, uh, this limit. And, and then you see that eventually it becomes more and more intense, but it keeps the same shape. Um, so how would that work in a system? I might have my slab of pagno. Here's a, a, a quarter centimeter rather than a centimeter. I was looking at uh, just what one might have uh, using the particularly large lasers at uh, NIF, uh, at the Warren's Liverpool Laboratories. And, and this is the idea of how one, one might compress to get to, let's say, 10 to 25th watts per centimeter squared. So this is a huge number. Um, it would be wonderful to get there. It's another factor of basically 1,000 um, to 10,000 more than we might get from triple amplification. So, uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to do, um, I have two themes to talk about today. I'm going to just talk a, a little bit about some of the issues in getting this to work and getting this to work robustly. And I'll talk a little bit about some experimental results. And then I'm going to be talking about the second theme, which is another way of compressing waves for totally different reasons. Um, so, so there are a couple of technological issues here. We just need to have timing and coincidence of the pulses. Um, we have to watch out for various instabilities. So we have to retain the focus ability. We have to make sure the plasma is, uh, is uniform. I mean, all the results that I put down there were for, were for the simplest model of what could possibly happen. Now, um, however, although, although there's a couple of things that we have to watch out for, we have, we have some tools to exploit. Um, uh, we, can, we have a resonance to exploit, and we average over uh, a lot of the homogeneities, and we can chirp the speed and chirp the pump. And let me show you what that does. So for example, one might worry about some of these other instabilities that might happen. Not the ones that we wanted, but some of the ones we didn't want. So what are some of the things that we might worry about? Well, if I have a pump going to the right and a pulse going to the left, even before they meet, before they meet, once they meet, then we know that most of the energy from the pump is going to the pulse. We have the equations for that. But before they even meet, Maybe we're worried that there's some forward scattering, the pulse pump is going through the plasma. There might be some forward scattering um, of the same type of, of interaction as the Raman backward scattering, where you, where you scatter into a wave that's a plasma frequency less than the frequency of the pump, but now it's going in the forward direction, in the direction of the pump. Uh, you can also imagine that the pulse going in this direction but also have a forward scattering decay. And, and how, would we, how would we be sure we didn't have those kinds of decays? We can also have some backward scattering just from noise that we might worry about. Well, here's how we might uh, suppress the forward scattering. We could put, if the whole system were in uh, some kind of density gradient, basically something that would change the resonance from, from from the Raman, anything that was forward scattered at one at, at one density as the pump and co-propagating with the pump as the pump and the forward scattering uh, uh, thing that we didn't want proceed, then they'll become detuned because uh, because the the, uh, the forward scattering at higher density will be different than the forward scattering at lower density. Well, you might say, well, did we get rid of the interaction that we wanted, the backward scattering. Well, here's where what we could do is we could have the pump itself be changing in frequency so that it's always in resonance with anything that would be back scattering. So we would basically just pick the pump, uh, the pump to be chirped um, in frequency so that it matches the density chirp that we have. And then so far as noise is concerned, um, it, it actually turns out that there is nonlinear effects that broaden the resonance 
for the reaction that you wanted because the growth rate is so high, whereas as far as noise is concerned, the, the, the depletion of the pump from that for the growth rates of the noise are low. So those are uh, more of a resonant interaction. So, so this is a way of selecting the parts that you want and avoiding the parts that you don't. I'm just going to skip over the next slide, which is just uh, a little harder to explain. And uh, I'll also mention that there are other, other things that we worry about, like uh, the fact that parts of the seed, if it's not a sharp enough front, might, might run ahead of the rest of the seed. This is a technological problem that we worry about. It's serious because you could mess up the plasma in front of it. But this is something that's also correctable with uh, uh, these uh, uh, density density terms. So, um, so what are the what's the experimental progress in this field? I mean, how how much have people done? There's a number of experiments done. Uh, I've been talking mostly about what we call Raman amplification. There are other ways you could use instead of instead of the, the Raman decay. There's also Bruyne decay. Bruyne decay as the two light waves, uh, one light wave is decaying into another light wave plus a sound wave. Um, and as opposed to a plasma wave. But the best results, and then there's, a, there's another nonlinear type of decay that has also been studied. However, by far, the, the really, the, the best experimental results were actually obtained by my colleague, Shimon Tsukaver over at Princeton University. Um, and it's already uh, probably the, the best results are already 10 years old. I mean, there's been some improvement since then, but, but, but basically it's, it's a Raman decay. And uh, even though the efficiencies are, are small, well, at least these are the measured efficiencies. The inferred efficiencies are much greater than that because it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to make sure the seed and the pulse have the same uh, spot size, and they also have to uh, find each other at the right time, and they have to be, of the, the pump has to only be twice the length of the plasma in order not to waste any of it. So there are a whole number of things that we know are sort of wasted because you don't have coincidence in timing and, and, and spacing. So when you put that into it, then these efficiencies are much greater, maybe uh, maybe on the order of thirty percent. So um, so um, so those, those are actually good results, and 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 moreover, besides being good results, they um, they they verified some of the physics behind behind the the mechanism. So. Um, so, okay, so just in terms of, of actual results, there's, there's a, a, a factor of 100 in the seeding intensity and, uh, and a decreased uh, duration of the seed. Um, but, but, but also, uh, Sukhaver passed his ray through density gradients, and he was able to verify that the tuning um, compensation that I just talked about that was an operable mechanism. It, in, in the case where he where he propagated in in the direction of the density gradient, oh, I'm sorry, in the direction when he chirped his pump laser in the direction of the density gradient, it became worse. When it was compensating the direction of the density gradient, then it became much better. So that was that was a, a, just a number of, of pieces of physics that we really wanted to get at, um, and. Um, what can we do to make it better? Okay, what can we do even to make this process better? Well, besides chirping the pump, we can also chirp the seed if we go into a regime in which there's group loss and dispersion from the seed. That means a higher density plasma. Um, the other thing is we could take the seed. So we were thinking that the seed would be a counter-propagating laser. It's not always easy to get just the propagating counter-propagating laser to come in at the exact right time and the exact right position. One way to initiate the interaction is to actually start with the plasma wave, and because that has zero group velocity and it can sit at the, at the end of the, of the plasma and just wait for the pump to come there. And 
it turns out that there's, uh, although these are not highly nonlinear equations, um, you can, in, in the regime in which you get good results, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence in setting up the plasma wave as opposed to setting up the counter-propagating wave. Um, I'm going to make one more point about um, about the um, the um, plasma amplification before getting on to the second theme, and that is um, what about what about going to extremely large. Um, uh, extremely short wavelengths, okay, go to extremely large frequencies. Can we actually get this thing to operate? Um, it, it, it operates fairly well. We were able to get 100 times the intensity of the seed balls in a small laboratory experiment using tie sapphire lasers, one micron radiation. But, but, but what about going to the X-ray machine? You know, if you actually wanted to break down the the vacuum, you have a choice of using, you know, megajoules in the optical, pressing that, using millijoules in, in the X-ray regime. And uh, if we were just going to compress everything, let's say, to uh, just to scale everything, let's say we compress everything to uh, the wavelength of the light that we're working with, then it's better to work with with millijoules in the in the uh, in the X-ray regime than than megajoules. In in the optical, uh, there's um, there's sources of, of millijoules in the X-ray regime. Just taking the XFEL output, for example, and trying to compress that. So, uh, so we have these these large facilities for intense X-rays, like XFEL and, and LCLS. Uh, this is the of, of but the question is whether we can actually com compress so. So the output from these lasers are, are, are tens of millijoules. Um, they could, um, but they happen over a significant amount of time, and you would want to compress it by a factor of 100 or 1,000. Could you do that in a plasma? Now, the issue in a plasma is that as we get to, um, as we could do this according to those equations, simple equations that I wrote. They didn't. They didn't depend on on on. It just said, look, if I if I have a plasma wave which is operating at the plasma frequency, then I'll couple two light waves at just the difference of those frequencies. There's nothing that said, well, could I do this for X-rays? Sure, I could do this for X-rays. I just need a much more dense plasma. Well, the issue with a much more dense plasma, besides producing it, is that a much more dense plasma is going to collide much more. The collision frequency of these dense plasmas goes with the both, goes with <coughs> with the density. So at some point, uh, I'm going to extinguish my plasma wave very quickly if I go to too dense a plasma. Well, I could get around that by going to uh, higher temperature plasmas, because that will then make the collision frequency less in a plasma. But then if I do that, then I worry about other processes in a plasma, namely Landau damping. So there's a window in density and temperature space. So, so it, 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 it turns out that we could, we could change our interaction just a little bit um, in this so-called Quasi transient regime. Um, they, I guess the, the the best way of explaining that is that there's a little sliver of light that gets amplified before the plasma wave gets a chance to uh, to damp because of the high collisions. And and there is a regime in which you can get to at least a soft X-ray regime like this. Um, it, there is. Um, if we were going to take XFBL output, um, you know, the, um, this is very noisy output. But uh, I'll just make the point that one of the things that happens when you, when you extract the energy in this way is that you clean up any of the entropy, uh, any of the noise in the, in the pump wave. Um, and even if I have uh, a very noisy pump wave and even a noisy plasma. I'll just show a simulation 
Yes, yes. I can just write it. Oops. Uh,
plum blazers are going partly in this direction and partly towards each other, then that means they'll be going slower than the seed laser in this direction. So the seed can go right through the pump and extract the energy from the pump as it goes through. So I'm just going to quickly summarize what I said about theme one, which is uh, we looked at some opportunities uh, for for Raman compression. Uh, we talked about experimental progress, how we might exploit resonance tuning, and talked a little bit about some of the new directions that we're taking to make things even more robust. Um, so that's that's taking light and um, and having a parametric interaction where I take photons going in one direction and convert them to photons going in the other direction but over a shorter period of time. That's one way of compressing light. Now the other the other theme is going to be compressing light in a very different way. Or not even light, but 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 any any waves in in the, that are embedded in a plasma. So we have we have these huge compression, multi-billion dollar compression facilities. One of them is NIF. I just drew the, showed a picture of the target chamber when they're trying. So those holes are for 192 lasers that are, that are going to impinge inside this, this, this target chamber. The, the 192 lasers are coming from a football, three football fields worth, American football fields, that's the size. Of, of where the lasers are coming from, and then they're impinging on on this uh, on this um, uh, um, little bottle, which is you know, the size of my thumbnail, and inside the little bottle that's the size of my thumbnail is a plasma that's a, a, a millimeter across, and it's a millimeter radius, and it's going to compress that to a thousand times solid density. So, so that's a huge billion dollar compression facility. And, and there, are, there are other kinds of compression facilities around too, like Zika compression. And when you have these, these million dollar facilities, you can ask, you can ask well, well, what if there was a wave in this plasma while we're trying to compress it? What would that, what would that look like? Okay, I have, I, I'm, I'm, I'm back, like, like, I've got this room and the walls are coming in, and it's making the room thousands, uh, one thousand of the volume. What if there was sound waves in the room? What if there was well, light waves in the room? Well, we know that we have uh, like metric expansion of the universe. Um, we know that there's a frequency downshift. We know that there's, there's less energy. What happens to waves in general? So. Um, so I wanted to know about what happens to these embedded waves as you're changing the volume. So, um, so well, it's it's pretty much like what happens with particles. So if I have a, if I have this room and the walls are coming in and there are particles bouncing back and forth, well then those particles are going to increase their energy and they'll do it in such a way that the action is concerned. And um, that. So, so there's a, an actual <coughs> conservation of the particles. I can, I can write the action conservation as the energy of the particle over the frequency, just the, the energy of the particle over the frequency of bouncing back and forth that we're giving the action. And so, so then I know that if I change the volume by a certain amount, I change the energy by a certain amount. Like now waves, and the same thing like the metric expansion of, of the universe, what will be concerned is the energy over the frequency. And I can write a different equation of state, or polytropic law, for how the energy changes with the volume. Now, in the case of plasma waves, there's a regime in which I could compress the plasma, and the plasma waves are, 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 are not collisionally damped. So that's an interesting regime. I can say what the frequency of the plasma wave, and I can say is what the what the energy of the plasma wave is too. And I can write down a polytropic law uh, for the plasma waves. But now the, this kind of compression is very tricky. It's very different. First of all, as opposed to um, the the light.
light waves that are bounding in the room if I, if I compress a plasma wave. I don't even know if it's going to obey the dispersion relation anymore. It may not even exist in the height. Depending on the plasma wave, it could, things could change quite a bit. It may not even exist anymore. That's B1 issue. Uh, the other thing is, is that I have to ask a couple of questions. So am I compressing parallel to the wave number, perpendicular to the wave number? I may get different, re different answers. If I have a plasma wave and I'm just compressing the volume, then I know that the frequency is going to go up according to the density to the one half. I can therefore write how, how the energy goes with the, with the volume or with the, with, with the density. And I'll get a, a polytropic or related pressure and volume that's different from uh, an ideal gas, whether it's a 3D compression or a 1D compression. And it's rather interesting. I'm just going to make one or two points about, I'm not going to do all the things that could happen. But I want to just give you a taste of things that could happen. So when you compress even the simplest wave in a plasma, which is just the plasma oscillation, oscillating plasma, and I make the simplest compression, I'm going to ask the question, first of all, whether I'm going to be compressing parallel to this oscillation or perpendicular to this oscillation. In both cases, the, the frequency is going to go up. But in one case, I'm going to be changing the wavelength. In the other change, in the other case, when I'm doing things perpendicular to the to the to the to the wave vector, then I'm not going to be changing the wavelength. And that makes all the difference in terms of the phase velocity of this wave. So, so in the case of perpendicular to k, I'm increasing, I'm decreasing k. This should be stage two. Okay. Um, uh, I'm increasing. Okay, I'm increasing omega, but the thing is, is that I'm increasing omega as uh, uh, less than I'm increasing k. So, so that means that um, I'm sorry, I'm not changing. I'm sorry, no, no, this is correct. I'm not changing k because I'm doing it perpendicular to k, but I'm increasing omega. So that means that the phase velocity of the plasma wave is going up. When the phase velocity of the plasma wave goes up, it encounters less damping in a plasma. So um, <coughs> on the other hand, so that means that it's less damping. Well, then, it, if if anything, perpendicular energy goes up because I'm compressing the perpendicular direction, then parallel energy doesn't change. And under expansion, it's the opposite. But now the phase velocity changes, and I can have more 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 damping. Now, in the case of in the case of Pressing parallel to K, okay, as opposed to perpendicular to K, then now I'm changing, now I'm changing the actual, the actual um, phase velocity to make the phase velocity less. When the phase velocity becomes less, I've just drawn the distribution function as a function of velocity. And when the phase velocity becomes on the order of the thermal speed of, of electrons, then it starts to it starts to give its energy and momentum to those electrons, and then it can drive current because it's it's if it's it just just in one direction. So you can get a very curious effect that if I have let's say let's say I have a, a plasma, just imagine this room, and in the middle of this room I make a little oscillation, okay, and then and then what I do is I now the walls of the room come in. That little oscillation that I have is going to grow in energy. It's going to keep on growing as the walls of the energy, as the walls of the room are coming in. It's going to keep on growing in energy. But it's also going to be changing in frequency and wavelength. And it could do so in such a way that, that while it's collisionless for a while, its, its phase velocity starts to change in such a way that all of a sudden it then dumps its energy into the electron distribution function. And that could create a sudden burst of heat um, or current, which means magnetic field. So I can imagine, just imagine I have this this um, this NIF facility, for example. It's, it's, a, it's a huge compression, billion dollar compression facility. It's compressing something. And in the middle, of there was a little plasma wave that was, that was going to be amplified by the compression energy, and then all of a sudden dump its energy into um, 
electron heating or into magnetic field heating or maybe ion heating. That could be very interesting. Um, we, we did some simulations on that. Um, I, I, I won't go over the, this list the simulations. The main simulation that I've just explained um, uh, just showed exactly what I was saying. That, that you increase the energy, you increase the energy, and then all of a sudden you dump the energy because the, uh, the, the wave is now a damped wave in the plasma as opposed to a growing wave. I'll, I'll just mention that there, that there, is, that there is one thing that, that we didn't expect when we did these simulations, um, only could explain it after seeing this, these simulations, and that is that there's certain nonlinear waves in the plasma in which the polytropic laws are yet different, in which as you compress compress the plasma, much more energy is damped into this way than we would have thought otherwise. So I'm going to stop over here to get under an hour. Um, and let me let me just uh, summarize what I said. There's questions I can come back to some of the slides that I skipped. But look, we there's two kinds of wave wave compression wave energy class. One was to, it, one was the, the goal of achieving the next generation of light intensities. This is just kind of, kind of it, it's there. Um, it, it, it's wonderful that uh, John Rowan and Donna Strickland won the Nobel Prize for, for triple amplification and getting us this far to output intensities of terawatts per centimeter squared, that could then be called 50 to 21 watts per centimeter squared, maybe even with a very uh, strong focus to 10 to 23 watts per centimeter squared, something like that. But how are we going to get to the next uh, three orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude? It's going to have to be through a plasma at some point. That's going to be the next way. And if it wasn't the, the waves that I, that I showed over here, maybe there's some close customs, some, some method of using not, not material elements, but, but elements that are already broken down. Uh, like plasma to get to the next generation of laser intensity. And we can ask that question separately for micron radiation and for X-ray or for or for just short wavelength like the on fluoride lasers. Um, it, it, it's, it's a question that's asked at each wavelength regime. So at the one micron regime we have true pulse amplification being quite successful. As we try to go to shorter wavelengths, we know that even that method is going to run into trouble, whereas we can start to begin to think about plasma. Um, and then the other thing, which is just kind of more from a, almost more from a scientific view, but there could be some interesting effects in these big compression facilities. We, we are compressing um, matter in the form of a plasma with unprecedented densities and pressures. And we can ask the question, well, what if something is embedded in the plasma. What if we have a plasma wave? And as you know, uh, there's different kinds of plasma waves. So I've just talked about the simplest plasma wave, what we call the plasma wave, which is the plasma oscillation. But you can imagine that other waves can exist in a plasma too. A plasma has many degrees of freedom, particularly if there's a magnetic field there. And I didn't uh, talk about it, but, but just as with a plasma wave, we have a paradigm of growing the plasma wave on the compression and then suddenly that wave changes in some way, and dumps all its energy into the uh, into a different form, just transforms its energy from oscillating energy suddenly to heat or current or magnetic field energy. Um, we could also imagine that that plasma rotation, plasma turbulence, there are other motions in plasma that un under compression can uh, can transform their energy. For example, in this room. If it turned out that, that we just had the air in the room and I was compressing the room to half the size slowly, then I know how much energy it took to get the room to half the size. I know the final temperature also. I know all of those things. But as soon as I say there's plasma energy in the room, okay, there's waves, or for example, if there was turbulence in the room, um, and now I compress to half the size, well, that turbulent energy might grow, or the wave energy might grow, and then I don't know ahead of time exactly how much energy it took to get to half the size, or I also don't know the partition of how much energy went into just increasing the temperature and or increasing the motion 
that was embedded in the compression. So those are, are uh, paradigms that are um, were first explored by looking at the plasma wave, but you can also look at that same paradigm <coughs> in other contexts too. So, um, so I'm going to stop over there, and thank you so much for your attention.
just you just write down Poisson's equation, you write down some continuity equation for the electrons, and some force equation, and it's it's done in three lines. So I wasn't gonna, it was too simple to ask that on an exam. So for the final exam, I wanted to ask, well, what would happen if the frequent if the if the density of the plasma was changing? And you could start, I, I knew the answer. It would have to be action conservation. But to actually derive that in a, in a simple way, uh, for an exam, I stayed up all night, I couldn't do it. Okay, so I ended up asking the easy question. So um, it, it, it actually, if you, if, you, if you want to write down fluid equations and get the right answer uh, for, for what eventually is going to be action conservation of these waves, is extremely tricky. Okay, so uh, and there's a lot, a lot of mistakes in the literature, you know, giving wrong answers because action is not concerned. If you start a priori um, insisting that action is going to be concerned, then there's a way of making that hydrodynamic description. I, I had it in the summary here, but I didn't, I didn't have the slide on. Yeah, good catch. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that you are close to controlled fusion. How close are we? Did I say I was? <laughs> um, okay, putting words in my mouth, okay. I, I don't know that I ever said we were close to controlled fusion, but I'll still address your question. Okay. And uh, the answer is is that is that certainly there are there's huge expenditures now, like this Eater project, which I didn't discuss. Okay, is, which is magnetic fusion. The EDER project uh, is is going on now in southern France. It's going to um, eventually create more fusion power than power that you're putting in, or more fusion energy than energy you're putting in. Um, their time scale for doing this, so oh, I don't know, it's a be another you know <coughs> 15 years before they actually do that. So um, I I think they're going to get there. They'll, they'll be able to do that. Um, the question is, is it going to be economical? I mean, th this is a $50 billion project that people are imagining, need, need to imagine uh, competing with, with oil, with, with gas, with nuclear power, with natural, other, other, other kinds of power. And the question is, are they going to be economical? And, um, and the answer is, is that the way people are imagining it right now, and also the way people are imagining the cost of these, this, this, these other power sources, there's, there's no way they're going to be economical. Um, it just is expensive to do it, maybe two or three times the cost of electricity, even if everything was. So, uh, so, so two things have to happen, in my opinion, for, to kind of bridge that. One is that I don't think people are recognizing the true cost of these other kinds of power. For example, nuclear power, um, it could be very cheap, but it's dangerous. Um, it, it, there's people compute that it's a one in a million chance for an accident, but they've built a few hundred reactors, uh, uh, fission reactors to date in the world, and there have been three serious accidents. And then when you have a serious accident, it seems like it's on the order of a trillion dollars damage. And so instead of it being one in a million probability, it seems like it's one in a hundred. Now, uh, of course, the people will say, no, it's really one in a million because we know not to build it. We know not to build them more safe now and, and not in areas where you can have a tsunami. Um, but look, the, we did the experiment and, and it's one in a hundred. And the, the next problem won't be a tsunami, it'll be something else, it'll be terrorism, something else. So, so if you compute that, then it's a huge, a trillion dollars, one in a hundred chance you need to insure these at ten billion dollars of reactor. That makes the, the, the difference a lot closer. The other thing is, is that I think people should be thinking harder about making fusion cheaper. And that would be, uh, I have my own personal opinions about that, um, and I think there are ways of doing it, not that much cheaper, but, but significantly cheaper, maybe at least a factor or something like that. So, so with those two things happening, I think the, the bridge could be, the, the gap could be bridged, but it, it's partly societal recognition of the other costs, and I think it's partly, we have to make, we have to be smarter about how we're doing future.
need a breakthrough. What's that? You need a breakthrough in terms of... Well, I, I think that there, you know, when people decide to have, uh, to build a $50 billion project, they don't want to build it, even if there were breakthroughs, they don't want to build it on the basis of breakthroughs. They want to build it on the basis of things that we knew 20 years ago. So, uh, don't get me started on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thanks again.